Hi, I'm Emma Tversky, and today I'm going to share eight actionable steps to build more accessibly with Angular. Let's get started. Accessibility is a vital part of web development, ensuring that users can perceive, understand, navigate, and interact with apps. In fact, one in four US adults have a disability that impacts their major life activities. Worldwide, about 15% of the world's population, more than 1 billion people, have some form of disability, with about 2 to 4% experiencing significant difficulties. In this course, Ally is shorthand for accessibility. Notice that the A is followed by 11 characters and a Y. Today, we'll use best practices and built-in techniques to address common web accessibility issues in a demo Dumpling Shop Angular app. By the end, our app will meet accessibility guidelines, WCAG 2.0 and ARIA 1.2 and pass Axe and Lighthouse Accessibility Audits. Everything you need for this project is linked in the code lab in the description box below. All of the getting started code is already in your GitHub repository. To begin, clone the code and open it in your favorite dev environment. Once we clone, install an ng serve, and you'll see your starting point is a basic restaurant app designed for this code lab. The code has been simplified to show the concepts in this code lab, but it's pretty non-functional. For example, let's see. If I click purchase, obviously I'm not gonna actually let you make a purchase. How do we know what we wanna fix? We're gonna start each example by recognizing the accessibility issue using a mixture of manual and automated testing. In the current state of the web, manual testing accessibility is mandatory. You have tools that can identify accessibility issues, but no tool can certify that an app is fully accessible. Manual testing ensures that you test for a breadth of ally concepts that include logical content order and feature parity. To manually test applications for accessibility in this course, we'll be turning on this computer's built-in screen reader and navigating through the app with keyboard navigation. For more information, you can see semantics and screen readers, uh, or if you go in the code lab, there's some good resources on how to look for all of this stuff here. So I'll go ahead and turn on my voice over. Accessibility shortcuts. And Check. you can see that I can navigate through. Google and insert into this. <laughs> um, so for the course, I will be exiting that just because I don't want to fight with a voiceover. But as you can see, that's what you'll be doing. Uh, you can also use the Mac built-in voiceover, which is what I was just doing by clicking enable voiceover in the accessibility settings of your system preferences. Or what I'll do is press touch ID three times, and that's the short key for turning the service on and off. We're also going to be using Lighthouse to run accessibility tests. So if I enter Lighthouse within my console and I choose just accessibility for desktop, I can generate a report and I can see my starting place of everything that I need to fix. Let's see, I might need to stop and restart it because of how many things I'm sharing. And while that's going, let's go ahead and look over at our last thing, which is if I go into my code, you can also use Angular's ES lint rules to lint your code for common accessibility issues and automatable attributes that we can check for. So if I go to all of my code and I enter into my ES lint RC JSON, this is going to be all of the ES lint tests uh, that I am checking for. And in my rules, you can see that the code already comes with these, uh, I believe, 10 
uh, I don't know, I'm not going to count, but 10 accessibility issues uh, or rules. And I'm choosing to say two. So this value can be zero, one, two, uh, with zero being nothing, one being a warning and two being an error. And that's choosing how, when I run my lint rules, um, these issues are tested for. Uh, so you can go to the ESLint repository to see more of these, but these are the 10 that we recommend. And you can find these all again in the code lab um, to add. So that's a great, really quick lift if you just want to automate a little bit of accessibility. And if I go back to my terminal, I can actually uh, do npm run lint. Oops. And, and while I'm waiting for my linting, I can see, oops, that I'm using too new of a version, but it'll still run. And we can see that we have one error being caught by one of those rules. So the rule for click events uh, have key events can see that there's something in my app that's not working correctly because there's not a key up or key event associated with um, something in one of my templates. So we'll fix that in a little bit. And if I go back to my application, I can see that I get an 87 for my Lighthouse Accessibility Score, which isn't bad, uh, but we definitely want to get it up to the green area of above 90, and we can do better and get almost to 100. Um, so we see we have a bunch of different itemized things here, and those are going to be some things we fix. So now that we have a starting place, I want to get started by fixing our first issue of the eight identified issues that I've picked out, again, by manual testing with voiceover, by running this lint check uh, here, and by doing this lighthouse accessibility test to see what's going on there. The first issue that we're going to fix is defining a unique page title. Providing unique, concise page titles helps users using Ally services quickly understand a page title's content and purpose. Page titles are critical to users with visual difficulties because they are the first page element announced by screen reader software. Angular is a single page application framework. And as a result, a majority of the transitions such as moving to a new page do not involve a page reload. Until recently, this meant that each page had an identical page title and provided no value for understanding the page's context or purpose. So if you can see that here, let's identify that issue and then talk about how we're gonna fix it. So as you can see right now up at the top, uh, we're looking really small here, but it says Ally and Angular. And if I open up a new tab of this and go to maybe a different page, let's go to our story, uh, you can see that this is like the about page of our website and it's still at the top just says Ally and Angular. And if I open one more, just to really prove my point, let's say I go to the last page, so find us. So this is like a map. Um, if I had location services that said like where I'm located um, in San Francisco. And we can see that all of these have the exact same page titles. So there's not a lot of information. So if you can think about this in like, let's say a Google search website, let's say you had like 30 tabs of Google search open and all of them just said Google search at the top, but you had 30 different searches and you were trying to find that one tab, it's really hard because you have to click into each one. So both from like a UX standpoint, it's just a terrible experience to have to go into each tab to figure out what's there. But also from an accessibility standpoint, that's the first thing your page uh, or your screen reader is going to read to your users. So you want to convey what's on the page in that page title. So in Angular v14, the router added a built-in method to define unique page titles out of the box. This provides a streamlined approach to ensure developers follow page title best practices. To fix this, we're going to use that built-in tool. So if we go to define page titles, we're going to go into our app routing module and we're going to add this title property. So this is the new thing that was added in version 14 when you update. So I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna go into app routing and go into my code. The other way you can check any of this is since we're on step four of the code lab, you can search to do step four and quickly jump to where you wanna go. And what we're gonna do is again, add that title property. So like, 
here is a title. And then if I save, I should be able to go back. Let's go to this running. It recompiled and see, here we go. Here's the title. So that title was automatically applied. So this is super easy. If you're familiar with former versions of Angular, it's much more difficult. And just for the sake of time, I'm gonna copy and paste this code to define my new routes um, and replace it here. And then this can be deleted. We no longer need that to do. Um, and if we look at the best practice here, what I like to do is convey like what that page is. So this is the shop page where you could buy things. So our shop dash and then the overall website. You can see common patterns of this if you go to other websites. Again, like Google search will say like what the search term is and then Google search. Um, so conveying the most important or most specific thing about the page and then the more general context. Um, so specific then general um, is just like a best practice that I like to follow. But if we save that and go back, then if I open up those tabs I just had, you can see that now I have our story, Angular, find us, Ally and Angular, and our shop, Ally and Angular. And so we are seeing the difference without even needing to go. So if I'm here and I want to go to that like find page, I don't need to go into each one. That's super cool. Um, and again, I'm just really excited because again, previously you would have had to add and manually manage these page titles and apply that in your app component. So this is a super easy way where I'm adding like, I mean, literally no lines of code were added, just like a few characters on a few lines. So super cool, super quick, super easy. Now that we've done that, we've verified our change and we're one step closer. So let's keep going. Your design might seem cool, but it's not cool if people with visual impairments uh, like colorblindness can't read your content. The Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or WCAG 2.0, define a series of color contrast ratios that ensure that your content is accessible. In Angular and on the web, you can define color palettes that ensure your components meet these standards and are visible for users with low vision and colorblindness. So for this, we're going to identify the issue by inspecting the page with the little Chrome DevTools inspector. And the thing that's really standing out to me on this page is this matte icon. Um, and if I click on it and hover it, I can see that that accessibility contrast is not good. So again, if I hover, you can see that that contrast value in accessibility is quite low. So significantly below the WCAG guidelines. If I go down to that value in uh, the actual Chrome Dev Tools by going up, I can hover it um, and I can see that that contrast ratio is quite low and I can actually try and fix it to either 3.0 or 4.5 um, and see that it needs to be much darker for the recommended value. So super cool that Chrome has that built in, uh, but now let's go change that in the code. So. To do this, um, we are going to go back into our code and look at the palettes we've defined. And we can see that I have this value. Um, I'm using this pink palette, right? I'm like really enjoying this pink, red, quite bright vibe. But this text value is 500, um, which if you're familiar with Angular, uh, you know that the material color palettes that we're defining are using values from 100 to 900 with 100 be the, being the lightest and 900 being the darkest. And so for the 100 to 500 uh, contrast is quite low, right? We're only like two color steps off of one another. So I'm gonna go ahead and change that to 900 and go the furthest away that I can and go back and see how that changes it. And if I reload, we can see that anywhere that that really light color was is swapped to a really dark color. Um, and I can also hover it and see that again, that color contrast is now uh, above four, which is meeting the guidelines that I need. So I've met that color contrast ratio. I can also go, this is something that again, that Lighthouse audit is gonna do a really good job of checking. So this is the contrast here, because again, this is super automated, right? We can test and see if colors meet it. And here it was pointing out that those icons were not doing very well. So now if I rerun my audit, I can see 
my percentage should go up. Yeah, so we got two more points there uh, and that contrast is no longer there. So we verified both manually by hovering and by running the audit again that I fixed the automated thing and my palette is now fixed. And the benefit of doing it in a palette is that anywhere that you're going to use icons or things that are using material uh, in this application that are using that text color are now going to use that accessible color with the highest contrast. Um, so super great to do it in a more generic place like your styles versus individually overriding like that that color is darker. The broader you go, the more accessible it's going to be. We fixed two things. We've gotten our score up two points. Let's keep going. And our next one is going to be another thing in our templates, which is using semantic HTML. We're now on step six. And let's talk about native HTML. So if we go to our application, we're actually going to be on our, our story page here. And native HTML elements capture a number of standard interaction patterns that are important to accessibility. While a paragraph can be styled as a span or a div can be styled as a button, semantic HTML elements ensure that screen readers and keyboard navigation understand the interactions and control your HTML. When you're authoring Angular components, you should always try to reuse these native elements directly when possible, rather than re-implementing well-supported behaviors. This ensures that the page has good content structure and natural content flow, and that the tab is in a logical order to assist users navigating the web with effective use of the keyboard. So here we have two things that we're gonna fix. And the first we can actually see again in that lighthouse score, if I go back, but we can see that it's getting mad that the heading elements are not sequential. Um, and if I actually go to this other tab and run another lighthouse, uh, test on this, it's going to get even more mad at me. <laughs> um, because it's going to notice that each of these HTML elements, uh, are headers in the wrong order. So these heading elements don't make sense. They're not, and are not sequential. Otherwise this page is looking pretty good. Um, so to fix this, we're going to go back into our code and we're going to go to, we did that. We're going to go to, to do six. And we're going to notice that in the about component, uh, I can even look at this and say, okay, I start with an H3, a header three. I go to a header two, which is supposed to be higher than an H3, right? This should go one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, then I go to a five and a six, but then I go back to a five. Then I go to a five, then I go, right? So this, this number order doesn't make sense. If I'm trying to go sequential, I'm not doing a very good job at that. So we're going to go and I provided the code snippet in the code lab, but we're going to take this and we're just going to reorder these things so that they have headers. Uh, and it's going to be the same text, but instead of using headers to decide the styling, I'm going to use headers as what they are, which is semantic HTML elements that our voiceover would understand as the header of a section. And then anything within that section, I'm going to mark as a paragraph because it's essentially just like a line of text. It's not a header. It's not like this section information. And then I'm going to use styling uh, and specifically Angular Materials built in styling classes to apply some styling to make sure that I get this same style um, that I really like without having to use semantic HTML to sort of hack it. So. If I save this and I save this um, and I go back, we should see that, yeah, so that reloaded and we now have what is clearly two headers with some text in the middle that still has fun styling, but isn't all a header, right? In general, text shouldn't all be headers. And if I rerun that lighthouse, I should see a fix there, which is exactly what we're trying to do. And yeah, so this page is now at 100, which is a little premature, but quite exciting um, because again, we fixed that semantic HTML thing. Now, if we go back here, we're gonna fix the other semantic HTML thing, which if we inspect, 
we're going to see that this purchase button, right? It clearly like in theory, the idea of this website is like, here's my dumpling preview. Um, this is like a super cool nuanced dumpling shop where like you can order hot pink dumplings, um, of different quantities, uh, of different filling types. So let's say we're going like chicken and tofu. Um, and I want to click purchase this purchase button should be how you purchase those dumplings. Right. Um, but I can notice that it's actually just a div that's styled to sort of look like a button. And even in the HTML, it's called button. It just is a div, which is really not what we want here. Because again, we want to use the sem semantic HTML for this. We want to use the native button attribute because when we turn on something like voiceover and we navigate, we can get to that control and voiceover will know what to do with that known interaction. So to do this, we're going to go to to do number six, the other one, and we're going to see here and see that even within our um, code editor, we know that there's an issue here, right? So this is what was being thrown by that lint error earlier, um, is it knew that this div has this click attribute that like it really shouldn't. And so we're getting an in-browser error because I made that ng lint error. So if we copy and paste the code that I provided, we're changing this to a button with uh, Angular Material flat styling, um, just coloring it a little bit, and then putting the exact same class on it, putting the same click event on it, and just giving it the exact same text. So again, the before and after is very similar. We're just making this a button. And by doing that, we get rid of the in code editor error. Um, and if we go back to linting, we can run that lint test again and see that that should also be fixed. And while that's going, we can also go back to our shop and we can see that there's now, like even the UX of this is great, right? So if I zoom in so you can really see, um, if I like click, there's like a click interaction, right? It's visible, the UX is great, right? So we think about accessibility as just fixing things for people using accessibility services. But a lot of what we've already fixed today, right? Like this color contrast just makes it easier for everyone. Um, or this like clicker interaction, like the fact that it now has hover and you can see that the like cursor changes and there's like known interactions there in a, uh, animation is like a really great benefit where fixing things for accessibility is not just for people who we typically think of as needing accessibility services. It's really a better user experience for everyone. So if I rerun that accessibility report on this and I go back and look, I can see that all of my linting has passed. So we're already much closer and we're up to the green space here. So we're up to a 91 because again, we fixed this button issue and we fixed this page all with just using semantic built-in HTML. So a lot of great things happening already and we're only about halfway. The next thing we're going to do is use selectable controls with Angular Material. So here you can see that one of the complicated interaction patterns for accessibility services is nested controls. In this demo, we're using um, all of these checkboxes, right? And we have nested controls where you can get like chicken, but not impossible meat, and you can get tofu, but not bok choy, right? These are nested controls where there's vegan, there's meat, but there's also nested options. But how do you indicate to a user that you selected a subgroup or navigated to the parent item? So let's think like when you're going through this interaction with uh, voiceover, how do you indicate that bok choy is a subchild of vegan? or that meat is a parent of chicken and impossible meat. That's a really hard pattern to try and work with. In Angular, simplified menus and controls uh, create a much more navigatable experience. And so what we want to do is simplify those controls as much as possible and use the Angular material list box to build out this interaction pattern. So I'm not gonna turn on voiceover just because uh, running a screen share while also doing voiceover on this step is like quite difficult. But as you can see, it's that same interaction pattern that we had, right? Where like you really can't convey these nested controls very well. And it's just a really poor experience for everyone involved. To fix this, let's simplify this a little bit. So we're gonna go to step seven, uh, scroll up. And 
we're going to be replacing the checkboxes with material checkboxes. So first, if we go to our code, I'm gonna swap here. Um, and we go to to do item seven, we can see that to create selectable controls, we have a ton of stuff here of all of our selectable controls in our shop component. And what we wanna do is just simplify this. So we're gonna define our uh, options a little bit differently um, here. So our filling option, instead of being a set of Booleans is going to be um, a, a list of strings. Um, and I made them a little bit fancier. So now we have a list of fillings. We have our selected fillings, which is again, a nice little array list. And then we're just going to, in our faux purchase, um, correct that the way we make a faux purchase is a little different because of that array list of strings. Uh -huh. Quick fix. I just want strings. Oops. There you go. Okay. Cool. Oh. Sorry, my strict typing is really getting the best of me here. So now we have um, just an array here of our fillings that we're excited about. I like made them a little bit fancier because why not? Uh, again, an array list of our selected ones. And then if we go down here into our selected fillings, when we make a purchase, we're just going to go through, create a list of each of the selected fillings that we have, um, and then just print that. And that's gonna be the flavor of dumplings that we're buying. So now that we fixed that part, we're going to go into the actual controls and just replace this like really complicated whole UL list uh, or unordered list with this provided here, which is, significantly shorter. And what it is, is again, a mat selection list of list options where each of the fillings that I just provided is going to be one of the options that I give. So I'm using the NG model um, to make sure that I know that all of the selected fillings are going to be my selected controls. And just again, give that selection list. Um, and here, notice that I'm giving an ARIA label, so I'm providing context for what that list is for ARIA or screen readers, um, so that when it's read as a list, it's read as the dumpling filling list. Um, so just something to indicate there. And then just each of my flavors is going to be one of those. So quite easy. And then I believe we can also just get rid of some styling um, just to make sure we clean up some things. So within that shop component, that last to do is just a quick little cleanup. And if I save all of that and I go back, we can see that, yep, without doing very much, we already have a bok choy and chili crunch, a tofu and mushroom, a chicken and ginger, and an impossible meat. And they're all within fillings. And you can see that the styling changed quite a bit. So I now have those click interactions. It's not that unordered list, but I've also removed the nested controls. So if I went in with voiceover, I would very clearly hear that this is a list of my fillings. I would get to pick each one and I wouldn't get confused about whether or not I was ordering like the parent of what flavor or whatever. And you can see that I believe if I run Lighthouse again, I would also get a slight bump just because um, I'm not using sort of like a, a less supported pattern there. So quite exciting. If we move on, the next thing is going to be very closely related, which is step eight is talking about Aria. In that template that I was just in, I showed that I was using this ARIA label, right? And so you see this a lot where ARIA labels are going to provide context for what uh, that control or what that HTML element is doing and how to be read to a screen reader. So that it's not just a button, it's a purchase button or it's not just a list of controls, it's the dumpling filling list. So it's providing that context for the screen reader or accessibility service. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to add a label to something that's missing a label. So this was caught, if we go in, we can see that here, the first issue we have is form element does not have associated label. So again, you can think of ARIA as a lot of those labeling technologies. And if we look, we see that the input 
didn't have a label here. So that was that filling. Um, and we already added that, right? Um, so that one was fixed uh, if we reran it. And the next one is our input field does not have a label. So this slider that's deciding how many dumplings I want, I always want more than baker's dozen, um, doesn't have a label as well. So if I go into to do eight, I'm looking to see what ARIA label is missing. And what I'm noticing is this mat slider is an accessibility. It's a material component slider. Um, so it already has a lot of built-in accessibility just because it's the material component version. It's a known interaction of a slider, but I'm not seeing any ARIA label. So I'm not providing context. So here I'm going to go back to my code lab, just to make sure I get the code right. And all I have to do is add this ARIA label value. So all I'm doing is adding just that ARIA label and that's solving it. So then if I went in with a screen reader or I ran that lighthouse command again, I would see that instead of just being an unknown slider, it would be read as dumpling order quantity slider. So again, you can think of this as providing context to what that interaction is. And I actually would probably uh, go back and remove the word slider since the uh, role would be read in a different place. So this is the context, not the interaction. And then the slider would actually, oops, read that. And a cool thing is if you hover, as you saw there, uh, I could actually open the ARIA reference, um, which is what I accidentally just did. Uh, if you want more information on that. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to run one more uh, accessibility report just to see that. And I've fixed two things with ARIA now, so I should see that fix. And again, this is like pretty intuitive. Yep, we're at 100%. Uh, more than halfway through, already at 100%. We're still going to do a little bit more, which is why I said that manual testing is super important. Um, but from the chance of automatable fixes, we have fixed everything that was automatically checked. So that's a super cool goal. I'm going to go ahead and give myself a little bit of a pat on the back. Hopefully you can too. And I'm going to exit out of Lighthouse just so that uh, we're not too distracted by that. Uh, but if you think about that, it makes a lot of sense, right? Like, let's say you're on a screen reader and you get to the point of selecting the quantity um, and you get to like you know, you change it up to like 13. There's no context for like what the 13 is of. So we want to make sure that anytime you're making a sl slider selection there, um, you're being told that it's, you know, 13 dumplings that you're about to order, that the order quantity of dumplings is 13. That way you don't get to the end and click purchase and say like, well, I don't know. I like got 13. Maybe that's like 13 fillings or 13 boxes. Uh, versus 13 dumplings, right? I think I would be incredibly sad if I made this one because I thought that it was like one box of dumplings um, and then a single dumpling arrived at my house. That would be very sad. We've gotten to the point of doing everything that we can without really digging into some of the nuances of Angular. And uh, we've done a lot, to be clear. We've done page titles uniquely. Um, just by using that built-in router property. We've changed the color palette to have color contrast. And we've really looked at the semantic HTML and controls, as well as changing that pattern of this uh, checkbox to be a little bit more intuitive and digging into the ARIA attributes of our templates to make sure that they're the most accessible possible. So now we're going to move on to part nine, which is where we add the power of the Angular CDK accessibility package to fix common additional accessibility issues. The thing about this is the CDK's accessibility module helps solve more complicated Angular specific issues. And by the end of this section, we're going to add the module so that we can continue and do more of this. You can read more about what the CDK Ally uh, package does on our docs website, but you can really think of it as providing a set of tools, just like anything in the CDK or component development kit. Um, it's going to provide you a bunch of tools so that you can build components that are more accessible. It's going to give you ways to hook into things like focus, um, live announcement, contrast, uh, all kinds of more nuanced interaction patterns that are common on the web that we want to give you a direct way to hook into those APIs and control. So to do this, we're going to go to uh, to do step nine. 
And it's gonna be really easy. Uh, all we're doing is adding this module. So we wanna import the accessibility module, um, just like anything in a module. We're importing it and then it's getting mad because we didn't use it, but that's okay because we can add it to the top. And then it's imported and we can save it and close out some files and go. And let's see, it should have recompiled. We might want to restart. When we import a new module, I always like to just reserve my application just in case to make sure I'm getting that import. But yeah, super simple. So we're getting that ally module again, uh, the shorthand for accessibility from the import in the CDK. Um, and really that's about it. Uh, and I'm realizing I put this a little low. I actually want it to be up here with all of my packages. Um, and cool. So we did that super easy, probably the easiest step so far because there's no visual change, right? We just imported a new module. But let's keep going and look at three ways to use this module. The first thing we're gonna look at is focus trap. If we open, I previewed this earlier, but if I open my color here, I can select a new color. So let's say like right now my dumplings are gold. Uh, let's say I wanna make them light green. So I could apply that color, they change color, and in theory they would arrive and be a different color. Um, or let's say like I went into dark mode, let's say I'm really digging this like plum color for spring, it's like very, um, seasonal. Um, and so I can apply that color. So when I open this uh, dialogue, what I'm doing is I should be opening this dialogue and redirecting the focus of like a screen reader to know that it's inside of a dialogue. So if I had voiceover open, I would want to contain the focus within this dialogue. Because while this is open, I want you to make a selection here before exiting out, right? You can click out but you haven't made any change there. So I wanna make sure that you know if you select this color attribute that I'm sending you to a dialogue and I'm letting you make a change here before applying the color and going back, right? And I want to make sure that the user knows that they've entered a dialogue, what they're doing in that dialogue, and then when they exit, I want to make sure they know what happened in that dialogue. So a really common accessibility pitfall is that you'll open this dialogue and somehow the screen reader will be able to continue to edit things outside the dialogue while it's open, right? That I could like change the quantity of dumplings while within that dialogue. Um, so I want to make sure I'm trapping focus. And this is something that we call focus trap. The Angular CDK trap focus directive traps tab key focus within an element. And this is intended to be used to create accessible experiences for components like modal dialogues where focus needs to be constrained. In order to do this, we're going to go to, you guessed it, to do step 10. And we're going to uh, actually go in and add just this CDK focus initial. And all that's doing is letting the user know where to put the focus. So CDK focus trap, um, if we opened the documentation, um, is going to have a lot of stuff there. Angular, Angular material. Ooh. Oh, that has to cut out. And if I go into the components in the CDK, I can see that within the accessibility package, I'm looking at focus trap. So this is things where I want to trap focus and there's a bunch of options here. So there's trapping focus, there's changing the focus region and there's indicating initial focus. So for the use of this code lab, all I'm gonna be doing is making sure that the initial focus is where I want it, which means that it's on the selection list. So if I go to to do step 10, I'm going to see that initially, if I were to use a screen reader, um, and I go to this dialogue, the initial focus would be on the entire, uh, or would be on apply color, right? It would be on like exiting the dialogue. And so I want to actually move the focus to the entire window so that you go through each of the colors before doing that, so that you know about that. So here I'm going to make uh, one change, which is just adding this CDK focus initial, which is saying, this is where I want the initial focus to be 
on that list of colors. Um, and it's as easy as that, stop. And then if I save it and I go back, it's recompiled and again, Accessibility shortcuts. <laughs> you can hear that I turn my voiceover on. Um, oops. Accessibility shortcuts. And if I turn voiceover sure. on and I move it over so you can see what is being said. And I go here and I enter. You can see that initially that color. Oops. You are currently on the text element inside of this box. Okay, so you can see that when I selected that color and I opened the dialog, I'm now focused on white, the first color in that. And if I scroll through, I can select a color. So I'm selecting color. And then I can exit by going to apply color. And I'm going to exit out of this so that I'm not fighting with voiceover. But what you saw there, to recap, since I was fighting with voiceover, is that I selected this color, and now my focus was on white, the first color there, versus one of these controls to exit, right? So I was put directly into the colors, and I was told what I was selecting, the dumpling color. Uh, and then I was able to apply the color and exit. So... That was done, again, using the CBK focus initial, but there's also really great stuff that I would highly recommend if you're using dialogues on other things like chopping focus. Um, again, I didn't need to chop focus within that dialogue because I am using the mat selection list, which automatically knows um, when I open this mat dialogue with a mat dialogue action to control and chop focus. I was just making sure that um, uh, the focus was where I wanted. So we've done that, we've verified, and that's step 10 off the list. So we verified it, our color picker now has correct focus trapping, and we're super close to the end. Our next thing is going to be super, super simple, uh, or similar to what we just did, which is again looking at that color indication, and this is announcing changes. So when I go and make a change, let's say I change the color, right, to green-yellow, this like weird neon when I exit, I want to make sure the user knows what just happened. So I want to announce to the screen, hey, you just changed the color. So you know, like there's been a change to the screen, you exited that dialogue and something happened. Another common thing is if you make a purchase, I want to announce that that purchase was made. Let's say this is like hooked up to some sort of payment platform um, and you've exited and you've made a payment. I want to make sure that this payment uh, or this purchase that I'm just console printing for now is announced to the user so that they know what they're purchasing or going into another window to purchase. So to do this, we're going to use something else from our accessibility CDK package, which is called Live Announcer. And so Live Announcer is going to allow you to notify when something on the screen has changed. You can imagine if you're attempting to submit a form or complete a purchase and not knowing that an error has popped up, right? Error handling is super frustrating. Let's say you go to submit your address because you're making a really big purchase and um, the zip code is off or something. And so you're just sent back to that form and visually there's an error on one of those form attributes. But to somebody who is non-sighted, you're not being notified of what the error is and you're having to go through the entire form again to figure it out. I know it's really frustrating for me when like, I don't know what the error is um, and I'm being sent back to a form. So error controls are a great place to use Live Announcer, which announces messages for screen readers to use using the ARIA Live region to ensure screen readers are notif notified about those notifications and live uh, page changes. So to do this, um, we're going to add the live announcer. Uh, so we're going to go to to do 11 and we're going to go into this component and add the live announcer attribute. So if I go to to do 11, we did that. Um, we're going to first go into the component. Let's see. Yes. So first we go into the component. We import the live announcer. Do do do. Then we go into the actual class and we want to just add the live announcer to the um, constructor here. And I'm just copying and pasting it so that you uh, 
know what is happening. But in this constructor here, I'm just gonna replace the constructor with this other constructor, which includes that live announcer um, added. So uh, let's see. Oh, it looks like I am missing something here. Oh, change color. Oh, um, and here, the last thing I'm going to do is in my change color, um, I'm going to change how I change color. So here in this change color method, I'm providing a color and then I'm re-emitting the new color. And what I want to add here is this live announcer attribute, right? So I want to change the color, but I also want to announce um, before changing that that color has changed. So here in this to do, I'm going to add this dot live announcer um, and I'm going to announce a uh, sensible thing that the new color has been selected. So before I close, um, and I'm going to do that anytime the dialogue is closed, just to notify. And then the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go into this component uh, and I'm going to do the same thing again for that purchase that I was uh, making, right? So the other to do is to do the exact same thing and add that live announcer, but in my other place, which is to import it to my shop component um, and do the exact same thing, which is import uh, live announcer from the CDK ally. I'm going to go into my constructor. I'm going to make sure I have a reference to that live announcer, just a private live announcer instance. And then I'm just going to, again, use that super simple thing where on my purchase, my faux purchase, I'm going to say this live announcer. So of my instance, I want to make an announcement and I want to announce the exact same thing I'm console logging, which is what that purchase is. So that in theory, you would notify. Again, this is sort of more of like a demo of what I would do with this, um, but error handling is a really great instance. And so here, I'm gonna go back, make sure it recompiled, it did. And I'm gonna turn on services. And before I do so, what you're listening for is when I click this button, I want to hear, uh, or you'll be able to visually read that what is being read to the screen or what is being read with voiceover includes that announcement. So if I turn on my services again. Accessibility shortcuts, check. And I show you what's being read. Application now in our shop. Purchase button, group name. You are currently on the button. To click this button, press control this slide is here inside. Oops. Purchase, purchase 11 documents in the color bowl. Comment is out. Purchase 11 documents in the color bowl. Change dumpling wrapper color, light green. Select it. Unlock. Change dumpling wrapper color, button, group, main. Select color, light green. You are currently on the button, group, to voice over all. Yeah, and so there you saw with a little bit of hacking of voiceover, given uh, the screen record happening, that when I clicked purchase, I was announcing again that I had made a purchase of this gold color. And then I went and changed the color to light green and you saw that it announced that a new color had been selected. So again, these are instances of using this instance of live announce to make sure that the user knew. And now, drum roll please, we have one last thing which is maybe like the coolest, but a little bit more niche thing. And that's something that we're gonna call high contrast mode. So Microsoft Windows supports an accessibility feature called high contrast mode. And this mode changes the appearance of all applications, including web apps to dramatically increase contrast. In Angular, we want to respect the user's preferences for this app. And so we want to use the high contrast mode detector, which again is gonna be another attribute within this accessibility package to make sure, yes, targeting high contrast mode, um, to make sure that we are respecting the user's preference there. So Internet Explorer, Microsoft Edge, and Firefox support this mode, and Google Chrome currently does not support window high contrast mode, but, um, there are changes being made to CSS all of the time to uh, better respect, again, different forms of high contrast, different color palettes, uh, prefers reduced motion. There's a lot of CSS things we can do for accessibility. And so this is one that we specifically want to look at for styling. So here, uh, since I'm currently in Chrome, I'm going to just mock what this would look like. 
uh, so that you can understand a little bit of the difference. And so we're specifically going to be looking at this purchase button here. And if I go into to do a, a 12, um, I can see that in high contrast mode, I would want to change uh, the difference between these two colors to be essentially like white and black, right? It's it's almost white and black and how high the contrast is. You can think of CAG as using a 4.0 color contrast ratio. That's what we changed initially where these colors are quite different. Think about if this background was white and this was black, like the highest contrast you can get is what we're looking for. So to support high contrast mode, we're gonna go into our styles CSS and we're gonna use the CDK high contrast mixin that's provided with accessibility. Um, so we're going to import this in again to do 12, our last one. Um, and so we're going to import that. And then we're gonna go down a little bit and we're gonna use this include um, in purchase button. So we're gonna go to our purchase button we're going to add the include. And so this is include, um, like the SAS thing. Uh, and then in high contrast mode, so when the uh, service or when this application is being served or used in a high contrast mode setting um, with that user setting turned on, we're going to add a really thick outline. And we could even like do more, right? Like let's go big here. Uh, and then we're just going to change the color to like the lightest possible version of, again, this pink palette that we're in. Um, just to go as light as physically possible. And so if you wanna see what that would look like, um, since again, we're not in high contrast mode, I'm just gonna go ahead and change it here so that you can see again what we're doing there. And so here, oops, my computer is mad at me. Swap this back. Ooh, why? Hmm. Let's try and use. Nope. Try and use no tilde. Oof. Can't find style sheet to import. Let's try. Always fun. Uh -oh. Okay, well, as we debug this and regenerate, what I'm trying to show here is that if we go to, again, these two things, we're using this mix-in to ensure that when we're in this high contrast mode, which is provided again by the accessibility service, that we're adding the context of trying to make the purchase button as dark as possible, again, just to show that difference. Um, and it's really unhappy with that import. There's something about strict importing that is not uh, working with my compilation. Okay, let's ignore that for now. Um, so if I go back, can you compile, please? Hi, contrast. Okay. So if I go to the instances of this, if I just mock what's being happened here or what's happening here, I want to show the difference. And so if that import is correct, which it will be in the code lab, you'd see that if I was a user that had this setting on, that I would then see this very uh, differently styled purchase button that really emphasizes what's happening there. It has a much higher contrast color. Um, the outline is much significantly larger, so it's really showing that control. And it has the exact same behavior, but again, it's just emphasizing that styling. So this is for maybe a more low visioned user or somebody who has these controls on. Um, this is a really common setting for people who sometimes have chronic migraines, um, who need to see really high contrast to not have to like focus really hard and discern the difference of like small nuances. And so if I was styling my entire app with high contrast mode in mind, I would go through in each of these controls, I would make sure had the highest contrast, uh, had the largest outlines. I would change the style even of maybe these dumplings that I'm um, showing to have a much thicker line to make sure they had maybe like a white background. Um, so really restyling your application again with this high contrast mix-in 
being included to make sure that you can do that. And again, um, I have uh, changed this import. Um, so you would just want to make sure this import is pointing to the correct thing. It's possible it's index. I don't worry too much about this. <sighs> nope. Okay. Well, we're going to keep moving on. But in theory, oops, hello. Okay. Let's make sure we compile. So <laughs> a little bit of an anticlimactic end, but let's move this back to not a ridiculous high contrast uh, to the uh, other one. And we can see that uh, visually, not a lot has changed from our application, but we've done a lot to change the different controls. We have almost wrapped up, and I just want to do a quick recap of the eight steps we did so that you can think about the changes you made and how they might apply to applications you are currently working on uh, that aren't a dumpling shop, because this is fun, but you know, there's a lot of other cool things out there that are using accessibility. And it's important that all of them uh, uh, think about accessibility and make these changes. So the first and probably the coolest is if you update your application to version 14, you can automatically change that page title. And again, this is like super cool, super built in. It's very new. But if I look for that routes definition, I can see that all I had to do was add that title. And now I'm seeing these unique page titles up at the top. So that was step one. Step two, we changed this color here of this um, icon to make sure that it had the highest possible contrast ratio and met WCAG guidelines. In step three, we changed the semantic HTML of our purchase button and our story to make sure that they're using semantic HTML. In the next one, we made sure that we had selectable controls by again using ARIA to apply an ARIA value to the slider to make sure that we were giving the user context with ARIA labels to ensure that we were notifying them what they were doing on the screen. And then we went over to our other control and simplified our controls um, oops, of our checklist here of all of our fillings so that instead of using nested controls and a complicated pattern with low accessibility, we could simplify the controls with a similar result to ensure that we have higher accessibility of our uh, control system. And that was everything we did without any Angular package. Then we went and we added the Angular CDK accessibility package or ally package. And we went in and we changed three things there. We added the focus trap to control focus of this color dialog. Uh, we also announced changes when we exit the color dialog, as well as when we make a purchase. Let's go in dark mode for this. Uh, using the live announcer to announce those changes. And finally, we looked at high contrast mode to ensure that users with a selection for a specific uh, change on their screen or a visual indication of preference are being respected by your application using the built-in high contrast mix-in that we provide. And so we did all of that and we fixed eight super quick, super easy things uh, for how to fix accessibility in this app. Congratulations, you addressed common web accessibility issues in your Angular app. What was your favorite step? My personal favorite is Angular v14's new streamlined page title options directly in the router. It's a game changer for out of the box accessibility. To see all of the solutions, check out the main branch in the GitHub repository. You now know the key steps required to resolving eight common ally pitfalls in your Angular application. Thank you so much for joining me. Don't forget to follow Angular on Twitter and YouTube, and I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.